Our next speaker is Sarah Haig from uh, Karolinska Institute, and I have your presentation here. If we can switch, please give her a warm welcome. Well, thank you all, and thank you to the organizers. It's been a great meeting so far, I think, and a great mix of um, presentations. So I would like to talk about human biological aging, and I do this from the perspective of a molecular epidemiologist. Uh, I think we had a lot of talks during this meeting already on the different hallmarks of aging and different cellular and molecular um, uh, specifics of aging. But when we consider uh, human biological aging, we also need to think about uh, tissue and organ aging, functional aging, and the whole organismal uh, aging perspective that we can, can capture with um, assessments such as frailty. And I also want to point out another thing, and you can see that there are a graphs with blue and red, so representing uh, different um, perspectives in uh, men and women. So we all know that men and women age differently. Uh, and this is also true when we look at biological aging. So not only for humans, but also this also applies to different animals and model systems where it is possible to look at it. So we know that women on general, in general have a, a better cellular and molecular aging perspective across the life course compared to men. But on the other hand, when looking at uh, the whole organism or functional parts of aging, then men are better off. So this means that there is some sort of um, a paradox here when looking at aging. And I think this perspective needs to also be acknowledged. So we heard some uh, examples of this already from the previous speaker, Joris, uh, showing differences um, in his models. And also yesterday uh, from Dudley Lamming showing differences in the models when it comes to uh, sexual dimorphism. So when we want to start an intervention, it, it is very likely that the intervention will actually have a different effect in men and women. So I think this, this should be acknowledged. Okay, so we also showed already in a previous study that it's when looking at aging, human aging, uh, and quantifying aging in different uh, ways, from cellular to molecular to functional aging. Um, it is important to know that these markers are correlated, but they also provide uh, information on top of each other. So make sure that whenever you're testing your model systems, uh, that you incorporate different um, types of aging measurements from different domains, and also to study how they relate to each other. Because aging is complicated, as we know, and multiplex, we need to assess it in many different ways to capture more of the, of the processes. So the research question today is uh, that I want to talk about is if we can find commonly used drugs that can alter human biological aging. And of course, those drugs could have a repurposing potential to be used also beyond the intervention or the indication that it was developed for. And I would like to answer this question by looking into epidemiological data. Ideally, of course, we would like to design the perfect clinical trial to study this. But what we have already is a lot of observational data. And if we can use this in a smart way to, answer the right, to ask the right questions and answer with good statistical modeling, we can already now uh, have some ideas about this. So, for example, if we have a longitudinal cohort, we can collect many different things over uh, many years in these type of cohorts. And we have information on, on biomarkers, on uh, different perspectives of aging, functional aging, etc., and also on the information of how many drugs and what type of drugs and comorbidities, etc., that the individuals have. So this means that we can then use this information and already assess what is the, the true effect of taking the drugs in such populations or such cohorts. So this is what I do uh, currently in my group. And we have a big project ongoing. So in Sweden, we have great data. We have a national infrastructure now for combining longitudinal aging cohorts uh, across the whole country. So my postdoc Thais is currently working on this and harmonizing the data across all of these uh, longitudinal cohorts. So in total, it's uh, 200 samples and many, many variables. So of course, this is a big um, task to do, uh, and also many collaborators to put into a project like this. 
but this is work in progress. And what we have done thus far is integrating data from three different cohorts, longitudinal cohorts of aging uh, that are Swedish twin studies. And this is a picture of a twin pair, Anita and Barbara. Uh, so they are part of one of these longitudinal studies and they were just um, portrayed on the Swedish television and uh, telling their story about aging and participating in, in a cohort like this. So that is also important to get the people involved, uh, the public involved, to reach out to them. But what we have is three different longitudinal cohorts. Uh, so SATSA is the longest follow-up, more than 30 years, with up to 10 different uh, longitudinal collections across these 30 years, with biological information on it, and also information on drug use. Uh, and then we have octa twin and gender, with, which have five and three different um, uh, longitudinal collections, respectively. Uh, so baseline age of these cohorts is SATSA is around six to seven years, and then it has a long uh, follow-up period. Whereas gender is between 70 and 80 years of age, and octa twin has a selection of uh, older cohorts. So only people above 80 years uh, is part of that cohort. So of course these uh, specific uh, selection protocols also matters in the way that you analyze the data later on. So that is important to consider. So what we did in these cohorts, we, they have reported self-reported drug use. Uh, and my student Bowen has translated these um, uh, codes into ATC codes. Uh, and we look into different drugs that have been used by at least 50 people in these cohorts combined. Uh, so currently, what I'm presenting today is, is the results from these antihypertensive and lipid-lowering drugs that we have studied. And we also did a sensitivity analysis or a validation so that uh, for some of these waves where we collect self-reported drug information, we also have information from the Swedish prescribed drug registry. So we can compare and see how well does it correspond to the registry data we have in Sweden and, and the self-reported part. And it turns out to be very high, highly consistent across these uh, two source data sources, which was of course uh, affirming. And then we look at different markers of biological aging. So one is uh, something we call functional aging index, which is a combination of different functional um, parameters. So we have hearing and vision, lung function, grip strength, and gait included in this measurement. And then we have harmonized these um, scores across the three cohorts. And you can see the longitudinal trajectories here in the three cohorts. And of course, the slope is bigger in, in the SATSA cohort because it has a longer follow-up uh, and in that way more data over a longer time period. So this is something that is then increasing over age. We also have cognitive function. And this, in this uh, particular case, we have something then uh, it's called a general cognitive ability score. So it's a combination of, of a cognitive um, domains uh, across different uh, areas. Uh, and this is, of course, something that is then decreasing with age, so that the cognitive, fun cognitive function goes down. And as you can see, it's not as much variation in the gender and octotwin cohort. And this is, again, because they have smaller uh, follow-up um, of the data. And we also look at the frailty index, which has been... Um, also presented by other speakers at this conference. So we use this, the accumulation deficit um, approach based on Rockward model. So it's a combination of 40 to 45 different domains of uh, symptoms, diseases, um, psychological uh, parameters, etc. Uh, and the combination of this is then that something that it's a continuous score, it's a ratio of the number of deficits divided by the total number of deficits. Uh, and it's something that is increasing and particularly um, accelerated a increase around the 70 years of age in, in the SATSA cohort here. So also in one of the cohorts, not in all three, but in the SATSA cohort, we also have um, a biomarker data where we have uh, assessed DNA methylation age. So this is um, from the same paper that the previous speaker was talking about, um, uh, Higgins Chen paper on uh, the principal component analysis clocks. Uh, that was just published in uh, Nature Aging. So here we contributed to uh, Morgan Levine's uh, group and her analysis by uh, providing data from this longitudinal cohort. So here you can really see how much this new principal component analysis uh, uh, contributes to reduce the variability and increase stability and 
of these clocks. So from uh, one uh, estimate on the left hand side to the right hand side, the, the um, trajectories, individual trajectories of the participants is really decreasing in variability. So also then providing more stable results um, when you look at follow-up follow data of these clocks. And the method that we use is um, a statistical modeling called conditional generalized estimating equation. And it's conditional on individuals because we have longitudinal data. So this means that we, in this way we can control for many things that are not measured. So we control for genetic background and different environmental factors that we actually have not measured in the data. And then of course we can control for things that we also measure such as agents, lifestyle and BMI and comorbidity, etc. Uh, and on top of this, because we have twins, we also bootstrap around the twin pairness, so to account for the, these type of correlations. And I should have put in here that we also aim to do stratifications of uh, sex, so provide different uh, estimates for men and women, because I just said how important that is. Uh, and the, these models are running as we speak, so the results for that is not ready yet. So that will be next time. Uh, so first, I just want to highlight that when you look at the cohort like this and you want to look at effects on drugs, uh, this is um, char baseline characteristics, so data when we start to follow the individuals. And of course, the people that use drugs at, at the baseline, when you start to follow them, they are overall, they are more sick. They are older, they have higher comorbidity, they have higher biological aging indexes in basically all of the things that I've talked about. Um, and also for other biomarkers. So this is, of course, what we expect. You have, uh, you take a lot of drugs because you, you need it, you have an indication for it. So this is also why it is super important to think about your models when you work with uh, observational data, because you cannot simply compare the people taking a drug to the people not taking a drug, because it will bias your results. So, uh, Again, as I said, this is, so this is to highlight that they are more sick. So this is also why we condition on individuals in our models. So we compare within um, the, the individuals themselves and not with, we do not compare with the people not taking drugs. Okay, so some of the results then. So first I will present uh, results on the functional uh, parameters where we have pooled results from the three different cohorts and have higher numbers then. Uh, so to start with, with a positive uh, trend, so for calcium channel blockers and for statins, we can see that there is overall uh, a significant trend of having uh, an improved biological aging. So for example, the first uh, measure, minus 2.18 for functional aging index. So it means that people that start to take a calcium channel blocker, uh, they reduce their biological aging, assessed with this functional aging index, by about two years when they start to take this drug. So this is then compared within the same individual before and after taking this drug. Uh, and there are consistent then improvements in the cognitive function and also a reduced frailty index with the calcium channel blockers. And similarly for the statins, it's not as high effect here uh, for the functional aging index, but it's still improvement on that. Uh, and for cognitive function, it's also an improvement and a reduction in frailty index that is also statistically significant. So this really tells us that these two drugs are, drug classes are probably uh, beneficial uh, above and beyond the, the certain indication that they're used for because we can detect these kind of big effects also in other markers of biological aging. Uh, then, looking at theoretics, it's also a consistent effect on the negative side. So really showing that um, when you start to take theoretics, it, it um, perhaps is helpful for the indication, of course. But when you look at the aging perspective, uh, it seems to be uh, not helpful in that way. With increased functional aging and reduced cognitive function, etc. And then for the other two drugs here, uh, beta blockers and the agents acting on the renin and um, angiotensin system, uh, the results are not really conclusive, so it goes a little bit in both directions. So it seems like the cognitive function is improving, uh, but the other two measures are um, uh, providing that the biological aging is somehow increasing. 
So then looking at um, the same um, drugs, but using the cellular markers or using different uh, epigenetic clocks with this principal component uh, analysis clock. We can again see that there is a consistent effect of reduced biological aging as assessed with these clocks uh, for the calcium channel blockers uh, and a somewhat reduced effect also for um, taking the statins, but uh, not really statistically significant. Um, and a little bit lower effects than compared to the calcium channel blockers. And looking at the diuretics, it's uh, quite high effects of also detrimental effects on the cellular aging as assessed by the clocks. Uh, whereas for beta blockers, we don't see a um, consistent effect, uh, but um, ACE inhibitors, etc., uh, we see more of a detrimental effect here, again, with an increased cellular aging. Well, taking these types of, of drugs. So to conclude, um, I think I've showed you some examples of how we can study human biological aging in epidemiological data uh, and the effects of different um, drugs. So calcium channel blocker seems to be a consistently improving both cellular and functional aging from the different aspects I pre uh, presented. Whereas diuretics uh, is the opposite, where there's a consistent worse effect on both cellular and functional aging across uh, the different assessments. Uh, some improved the uh, functional biological aging when taking statins, but not so profound effects on the cellular aging systems. Uh, and probably worse cellular aging uh, with um, ROS agents. And for beta blockers, it was a bit of a mix. So, so improved cognitive function, but worse um, biological aging in some other aspects. So with that, uh, I would like to thank you all for listening and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah, for a fantastic talk. Uh, do we have any, we have one from Nia down here. Where's Matt Foreman? No. <laughs> Well, that's, that's the next, you know, that's the, she wants to be invited next year. <laughs> uh, uh, no, that, that's, that's a terrific, uh, I think it's a very important approach, and I, I'd like to follow it later, but I have a fundamental question. You know, you're using twins, and I bet that 20, 30% of your twins, one of them was born below five pounds, because that's how it is. P uh, children below five pounds age rapidly. Okay, there's the Barker hypothesis, start with the Barker hypothesis and many other studies. So I just wonder if you chose here by accident, or did you account for the birth weight because maybe that's confounded who was using drugs to begin with and they will maybe age anyhow later. Yeah, I have not controlled for that and um, I think we have that so I can do it in some studies uh, and this is also why we will look in other studies but overall I can tell you that I mean in, in twin studies um, most of the studies show that there are actually they are good representatives of the general population and, and, and also other cohort studies so we don't see these big effects on aging just because they're twins but thank you for the comment yes. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, is there an explanation for the discrepancy between what you find here and clinical experience, for example, that we know that they are very beneficial for long-term effects on cardiac patients, but here they came out with negative effect on general aging? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. And that's why I also from the beginning said that I'm presenting this as a molecular epidemiologist, I'm not an MD, so I'm just showing you the data, this is the data I have, and then the interpretation, I think we have to do it together, because I, I don't know, I don't have an answer. Cool. Yeah, I just want to back Sarah on the twin stuff near, uh, <laughs> as uh, director of the Danish Twin Reds. We actually sp spent like a decade uh, looking after such effect, because you're absolutely right, if twins had a different aging pattern compared to singletons, the twin result would only be relevant for twins or the general population. But luckily, we sh twins have a tough start in life, but once they are over that, we can't see it in. Overall mortality, cause-specific mortality, the only difference is actually they have less suicide, maybe because they get a, a good companion. 
And actually we uh, traced down those with the biggest difference in birth weight and had them in for a day, full blown, metabolic and so on, for a group third, a group in the 60s. And the difference we could dig out was that the big guy was one centimeter taller. Huge at birth compared to the one. So, welcome. Thank you, Paul. I think we will uh, stop here and go to the break. Uh, but thank you so much, Sarah. That yes. was uh, fantastic.